perhaps one of the greatest challenges to faith, if not the entirety of the human experience, is that we often must live in the gray. The zone of uncertainty and lack of surety in which we struggle with paradox and contradiction, even in the face of situations screaming out for moral clarity. Especially in our current moment of misinformation, disinformation, polarization, and demonization, in which so many of us seek to reduce everything to a binary, unable to rise above the siren songs of our narratives, complicated and intractable dilemmas still require from us nuance, subtlety, and deliberation. This inability but necessity to live in the gray is at the heart of our struggle with the Israel-Hamas war. It is a perfect storm as the challenges to critical thinking meet the most complex historical and political challenge of our times. If we are serious and thoughtful about understanding this issue with the hopes of resolving it, we must be comfortable standing in that middle place, a middle place in which we support Israel's right to defend itself against genocidal jihadism in a just war, but still continue to question whether it is possible for this just war to be fought justly. A middle place in which our heartbreak and pangs of conscience at the loss of civilian life in Gaza are amplified by our outrage at Hamas's willingness to sacrifice their own children in pursuit of our destruction. A middle place in which, as the controlling entity in Gaza, Israel should have better ensured access to humanitarian aid, despite the reality that so much of it is diverted to support Hamas's survival in hopes of perpetrating another October 7th. And a middle place in which the torture and suffering of Israeli hostages is often obscured by unqualified cause for a ceasefire. I am proud that over the last 23 years, this community has supported me as I've stood in that middle place, welcoming pursuers of peace to speak from this bima, from Israeli officials to former leaders of the PLO, often with great controversy and pushback because the striving for a two-state solution is the only path forward if Israelis and Palestinians are to live in peace. J Street has been one of the few organizations that has courageously and committedly stood in that uncomfortable but authentic gray space, supporting Israel's survival and defense and calling for the release of hostages while pushing our government to do all it can to reach a ceasefire agreement that will bring our people home, end the catastrophic suffering of the innocents in Gaza, and ensure Israel's security against an implacable foal. I am proud to be a second generation rabbi who has been involved with J Street from their beginnings, now serving on the executive committee of the clergy council. And I am proud to welcome Nadav Tamir, J Street's executive director in Israel. Nadav Tamir joined the Israeli Foreign Ministry in 1993, serving as political officer at the Israeli Embassy in Washington, D.C. In 2006, he was named Israeli Council General to New England, a, posi a position he held into, until 2010. Upon returning to Israel, he joined the policy planning unit of the Israeli Foreign Ministry, where he served until accepting the position of senior advisor to the president under Shimon Peres. Nadav is an advisor for international affairs at the Paris Center for Peace and Innovation. He's a member of the board of the Mitvim Think Tank and the steering committee of the Geneva Initiative. Nadav Tamir, it is my honor and pleasure to welcome you to our Bima and to hear your sage counsel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rabbi, and thank you for amazing uh, sermon and music. And uh, I'm a, I'm from a kibbutz, by the way, so I'm not as informed about uh, Jewish rituals. But I have to say I was inspired this evening. And uh, as being being from a kibbutz, I never thought that I will feel overdressed in a synagogue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I guess, I guess that's the West Coast, uh, uh, yeah. 
Um, so yeah, you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm, first of all, I'm happy to be here. It's, by the way, my first time in Seattle ever. Uh, so thank you for having me. And I'm also happy to be uh, in the US um, touring uh, several cities, uh, first time after October 7th. I know it's very hard to say the word happy these days. Um, I was in Boston when October 7th occurred, was supposed to do a same kind of tour. And uh, when my daughter burst into the room and said, uh, Ido, my son, told me to wake you up because there is a war in Israel and he was already in reserve duty. Um, you took us some, you know, few hours to understand the scope of the tragedy and I was able to get a flight back home and since I'm there, I'm uh, volunteering in the forum that helps the families of the hostages, uh, which is uh, give some comfort, but also it's a, an um, uh, emotional roller coaster to be with them when they are hoping for a deal and then they're um, frustrated when there's nothing and it's, it's awful. And on my way to Israel, I already knew that uh, my son and son-in-law are in reserve, that my uh, friends and family from Be'eri, Andreim, uh, some of them uh, were murdered, some of them hostages, and uh, the others are evacuated from their homes. The kibbutz where I was born, Kibbutz Manara, on the border of Lebanon, also was evacuated uh, because of the Hezbollah uh, anti-missile rockets. And I did find a completely different Israel than the one I left a few weeks before. Um, yeah, and, and uh, it's not over, the tragedy, the trauma, the feel of, uh, feeling of insecurity are still very much there. Israelis are living October 7th every day again and again, and this is also what our media is showing us. Uh, for some of us, unfortunately, to, to not too many of us, we also try to pay attention to what's happening in Gaza and the carnage and the tragedy in Gaza, which is uh, also uh, awful. Uh, yeah, I, I said that not many Israelis are aware of it because our media doesn't show it. And uh, for many Israelis, they either feel that this is Hamas propaganda, an anti-Semite world that doesn't understand our predicament, or they think that if it does happen, then Hamas deserve it. But some of us feel that you could also feel the pain, um, even when your heart is full with the, you know, with the anger and the sadness because of of our friends and family and others. Um, but when I came here to the U.S., I found uh, a Jewish community that is no less traumatized. As someone who really believes that Israel is not only the home of us Israelis, but the home of the uh, entire Jewish people, I know that you are with us in our pain, in our joy, and in these days you're also very much uh, a part of the trauma. So it was very important for me to come here and to understand where you all uh, are feeling in this moment and try to kind of tell you uh, where we are. Um, so yes, it is probably the worst days that I remember uh, as, as a Sabra was born in Israel. Um, but I have to say that with all the bad news um, and you know the, host the 133 hostages are still in Gaza, uh, we know that 35 of them are not alive, but uh, you know, but we think that probably more. And uh, what the families are going is 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 horrible. I have to say that even though Israelis and Palestinians, because of the tragedy and the insecurity, moved to a more hawkish place, um, actually the reality moved to a more dovish place. And I know it is very hard to understand for many Israelis and Palestinians. But the reason why I think the reality moved to a more dovish place is that all the assumptions that were broken in October 7th 
or the assumptions of those who thought that you could maintain the conflict but not really solve it, uh, that you could uh, have normalization in the region and ignore the Palestinian issue, that we could rely on our very sophisticated military to protect us and we don't need diplomacy, that we could empower Hamas with Qatari money and other ways and keep the Palestinian moderates who believe in a two-state solution high and dry, um, that, uh, you know, we don't really need America and we don't really need those liberal democracies who criticize us and we have friends like Putin or whoever. And the right wing, most right wing government ever could bring us security. All those things were, uh, were broken and I think uh, in time, and we're starting to see it already, already when people, people move to a more rational place, they're starting to understand this. Um, at the same time, the international community was never as serious about the two-state solution than I remember since the days of Oslo. And for us in J Street, for me as a progressive Zionist who believed that you could be pro-Palestinian and pro-Israeli at the same time, um, I, I, I never thought that uh, this will come and that it will come after a tragedy. But we know from our history that it was the tragedy of the Yom Kippur War and the surprise attack that eventually led us to the peace with Egypt. And it was the trauma of the first intifada that eventually led us to Oslo, and the trauma of the second intifada that eventually led us to the withdrawal from Gaza, even though it was done unilaterally, which was not very helpful because we did not empower a partner on the other side. But I do believe that we have a huge opportunity to turn this lemon into limoncello, I, I prefer limoncello on limonade. It's, limonade is too sweet for me. Um, because, um, you know, Israel received an amazing support from the American administration. Um, President Biden stood on our side and was the father figure that Israelis did not get from our own government. He showed amazing empathy. And he also sent us amazing material support in two aircraft carriers, in a nuclear submarine, creating a coalition against the Houthis who attacked us, saying to our neighbors, don't. And now he's saying it again when Iran is, uh, is uh, threatening to uh, retaliate. Um, and while he's doing all of that and gaining so much more leverage, is also for the first time since he became president and we... I don't want to get into American politics. But uh, for the first time since his president, uh, is actually serious about creating a political horizon. Uh, he understand that the only way to defeat Hamas is not only by military way, but it has to have a diplomatic plan. And the diplomatic plan is including a two-state solution, including a revitalized Palestinian authority to fill the vacuum, a regional architecture that will help us to replace Hamas and will help us uh, uh, get to a political horizon. The Saudi normalization that could bring the entire Sunni Muslim world. Um, those are things that we haven't seen uh, for a long time. And that's why even though I, I'm here uh, still with a lot of pain and sadness and trauma, I want to tell you um, that uh, I really see um, a lot of reason for optimism that we could move out of this uh, deep place into a uh, promise to change. And as someone who really believed that the two-state solution, as you said, Rabbi, is the only solution for, for those who believe that both Israelis and Palestinians to, to deserve to have their own state. And if we don't add the occupation, the occupation will end us. This is the more optimistic moment that I remember since the days of Oslo when I started to work at the office of Shimon Peres as foreign minister. And that's why I want to leave you with hope. I want to also tell you that I learned from my mentor Shimon Peres that optimists and pessimists die the same way, but they live very differently. And not only that it's more um, healthy and fun to be optimist, it's also more constructive because only with optimism we could have the energy to make things better. And we have to remember that our national anthem 
is Hatikva, which is hope and not fear. So I want you in these hard times to thank you for being with us, for caring about us, but not to lose hope that we could actually um, turn this tragedy into a great opportunity. Thank you so much for having me.